Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the first Bonavera discussion group of the new academic year. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, all of the uh, attendees, particularly those of us who are joining us from the, who are mooters in the Price Media Moot. We're very excited about the new mooting year and very delighted to have those of you who are going to participate in the Moot to join us today. My name is Kate O'Regan and I'm the director of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights in Oxford. We're delighted today to welcome Professor Barbara Prainsack, who's a professor at the Department of Political Science um, at the University of Vienna, as well as at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. Barbara works on the regulatory and ethical issues relating to biomedicine and bioscience. And we're very much looking forward to hear her talking about the question of whether sol solidarity has a role in keeping uh, big data safe. We're equally delighted to welcome our new British Academy Global Professor, Martin Scheinen, who joined the Bonavero um, uh, earlier in the summer. Um, he came to the Bonavero from the European University Institute in Florence, and um, he is, has a long career in human rights, both in the, on the practice side of human rights as a member of the Human Rights Committee and a special rapporteur, and as a researcher and scholar. So a very warm welcome to both you, Barbara, and to Martin. Um, just to remind those of you who haven't attended a Bonavera discussion group before, um, the format is that Barbara will speak for 25 or 30 minutes, followed by a response from Martin, and then we will open it up to questions from the floor. Because we're in webinar format, we ask you to lodge your questions in the Q&A at any stage. You don't have to wait until the speakers have finished speaking. And then I will try to moderate the questions and put them to, the two, to our two speakers. So please feel free to use the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side. Otherwise, just to say that we will be recording the event and it will be made available um, on our YouTube channel um, afterwards. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we like to take the questions through Q&A. Um, so uh, we look forward very much to what we have to hear today. Barbara, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my thanks to Professor O'Regan, Professor Shine, and to everyone um, who invited me and who's taking the time to participate today. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Um, what I'm going to do in the next 25 minutes or so is to, to share with you what I think is the key challenge in keeping big data safe at our age. I'm going to briefly address some of the important solutions to this problem that has, have been presented. And I'm going to um, give an introduction into the solidarity-based data governance program that colleagues and I um, here at the Center for the Study of Contemporary Solidarity and elsewhere, our international collaborators have been um, developing and some of, some of which is still very much work in progress. So I, I welcome um, critical comments very much. And then I will, um, I will say a few words, if we've got time left, about how I believe that using data for nudging, which is very on vogue at the moment, is actually also a data governance problem. Um, I'm, as I said to Martin uh, before, before we opened the webinar, it's a bit of an experimental argument in that I'm not yet sure that it is actually um, uh, one that works within that framework, but, but um, also here I'm very much looking forward to your, com to your comments and suggestions. So what is the challenge? So to put it very simply, um, many policymakers and practitioners um, are uh, faced with the assumption, or some of them even make the assumption themselves, is that digitization means to do things online that we have been doing offline. So um, digitizing electronic uh, or, or, or patient records means to sort of type up uh, the, the written records and put them into a computer and of course this is this is not this is only part of the story so partly of course those things that we have been doing offline we are now doing online so things such as um, sleeping engaging in exercise sports and eating is now um, uh, captured also in data 
So those, those data about things that we have been doing without anybody watching, without our um, personal devices, computers and, and, and remote sensing watching us, we have been doing this and now these data are available online. Um, but this also means that, and Harry Surden called this the, the end of structural privacy, meaning that the mere fact that things that we did um, without anyone seeing and knowing are now recorded means that ever wider aspects of our bodies and lives are datafied. And that means that the sort of the sphere of privacy is, is becoming smaller, not because of any nefarious doing on anyone's part, but simply because those data are now available. And, and, and a point that I think is very important to make is in this context that in, in the era of data linkage, all data are, are health data potentially. Because I think these examples on this slide already show that um, running data step counts. Um, if you use uh, apps to support nutrition and, 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 and dieting, whatever, all this information can now be used and will be used, <laughs> I'm, I'm inclined to say against you. Um, not, not only against you, but also of course, in favor of, um, uh, in, in the context of uh, personalized healthcare services, in, in, in the context of uh, personalization and insurance. This slide is a slide um, uh, that comes from bioinformaticians uh, in Harvard um, in a paper in 2014 where they argued, Weber et al. argued that this is the information that we need to really personalize healthcare. And of course, I'm not expecting you to read this, but if you see just some, um, some, uh, some of the types of data here on the slide includes police records, uh, social media postings, and the obvious things that you would connect with uh, medical information, such as data from physical examinations and so on. So in, in an era where we can link information and we, where we can use seemingly innocuous information to derive health relevant um, conclusions, everything is potentially sensitive data and everything is potentially health data. Um, another point that I think is important to just map the, 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 the scene um, in a way for, for um, our problem definition is that there are different processes that raise different issues that are often conflated. Um, and these are the processes of datafication, digitization and automation. Um, they each um, create, sorry, they each create um, different challenges and they each um, um, refer to slightly different uh, practices. So datafication is the recording of, of, of information or the capturing of data about things that we do and about our bodies that were not captured previously. Digitization really means to move things from the digital, to, uh, from the analog to the digital world. And automation means to replace the work of humans by the work of machines. And these, the three processes also of course, are not only a representation, a new way of representing the world, but to use hacking's term, they're also a way of intervening into the world. This is just one very trivial sounding example from, um, uh, from the research that I did for my book on personalized medicine, which is really about data-driven medicine also, is, is by a young uh, student who says that he was using a um, um, fuel band when it was still sold by Nike, and he said, when I look at my fuel points at the end of the day, I decide that I still have to go for a walk to reach my score. So these cap datafication methods and, mach and, and machineries and, and tools are performative. They're not just recording, they're also creating new um, practices. So as I'm saying here, data are not merely representing reality, but they're also creating new realities and creating new challenges. So what are the challenges? just a few that I think are um, particularly relevant uh, and, and have not yet been uh, sufficiently addressed. Um, the fact that we're losing privacy not by anyone's, as I said, evil intentions or nefarious practices, but just by the fact that we are capturing a lot about ourselves and our lives. The ways that we stratify in healthcare, in insurance, in education is becoming much, much more granular and increasingly um, the old, broad, sticky demographic and, and, and epidemiological categories are giving way to very dynamic, granular categories um, that emerge out of data intense practices. 
then a point that a lot of people mention when we talk about data protection and privacy is that a lot of things that we would like to do for public benefit, think of healthcare, research and disease research, uh, has a lot of red tape around it. So it's, you have to jump through hoops to do um, disease related research that uh, a private company might be able to do very easily because people have by definition consented to their data being used when they used the services that captured the data in the first place. And of course, increasing power symmetries between data subject and data users. And here I'm, I'm getting to the key point. So this is just one slide. I've once called it the I Leviathan, that you know, an analogy to the classical Leviathan that people um, give their freedoms to in order to get something back. And it was civil freedom that we used to get back and now it's something, something else, comfort, but also the ability to, come to participate in parts of society that without uh, the large uh, technology solutions we would not be able to do anymore fully. So obviously the, the challenges that I had on this slide are not, are not, are not uh, they, they have been um, recognized by people and people have been thinking about solutions, especially also the power symmetry problem. Um, the fact that um, Jerry Kang called it big brother and company man, that um, the large institutions that are now um, knowing a lot about us is no longer big government and big brother is no longer big government, but it's increasingly also um, institutions, privately owned companies that are not publicly accountable. So what are solutions that have been developed? Um, a lot, a lot, for a long time, the solution was to increase the control of individuals over their data. And this comes from a good place. So the EU general data protection regulation, but also um, approaches such as by my and your, because she's also based in Oxford, um, colleague uh, Jane Kay and, and her colleagues, dynamic consent, really a very welcome paradigm shift that has made granular um, and, 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 uh, and process-based understandings of consent possible. Um, but, and here's the big but, individual focused solutions, as important as they are, they also have some downsides or they have some, some, some ways in which they fall short in the digital era. If I, if I put it, if I wanted to put it uh, provocatively, I would say that they are still paper age solution for digital age problems. Some of the problems that this list is not exhaustive, alert fatigue, you know, if you get asked as an individual all the time to opt in, opt out, you will at some point just go on autopilot. You won't read it anymore. Feasibility and cost. Sometimes granular solutions can be very costly. Not everyone is able and willing to exercise control. Um, then something that I've alluded to already, how realistic is opting out in a situation where if you're not on your WhatsApp group, you can't participate in your children's uh, parents' uh, um, deliberations anymore, you can't communicate with the school, and so on and so on. In healthcare, sometimes you can only get an appointment if you have an email account, which means that you have to use Gmail or one of those services unless you have an institutional um, email. It shifts responsibilities to individuals. So the, individual folk, the individualistic framing and, and the attempt to, to solve the power symmetry problem by increasing individual control is of course, in a way preempting collective action and oversight because it isolates, you, it isolates data governance questions into the relationship between you, the data user, uh, the, the data subject and the data user. So the company asks you, the state asks you. So the data users are not seen as a collective, but they're seen as an aggregate of individuals. Um, and yeah, so the other points on this slide, they, they speak to that really. Uh, maybe one thing I want to highlight here is that the individualistic framework also ignores what I, what I called um, in this paper that, that um, I post, I pasted here at the bottom, the multiplicity and relationality of data. So what do I mean by that? Um, sorry, I can't. Now it works. What do I mean by that? So a lot of the, 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 the ethical approaches 
um, that have also influenced data ethics and data protection to some uh, and the idea of consent they come from um, directly or indirectly from medical ethics right a medical ethics has its reference point the physical body and when I cut into someone's body I need to ask the person in and with the body wh whether I can get their consent so the data body is very different from the physical body in that the data body does not have clear boundaries the data body um, can be in several places at the same time. My personal data can be in 5,000 places and can be interrogated by different people at the same time. So there's no clear border. And also my data, my information, um, allows for people to draw conclusions about other people. So asking the data subject for consent for what is done with her data does not solve the problem that these data of this person here on the slide can have effects for other people. And this is why uh, uh, legal and ethical instruments that derive from this physical body reference um, are not sufficient. So I said that individual level approaches have ma in many ways the problems of the paper age, also in that they are still influenced by this um, medical ethics paradigm. Um, what what we see happening increasingly now, and these are just again examples, is that people in addition to emphasizing that of course we need good individual level protection, we also need more collective control over what's happening with our data. So in some cases we still want to be asked as, people, as individuals, um, do you want to share your, your, um, your uh, tissue sample? Um, with research um, and what sort of research, but in some cases we also need mechanisms and instruments that will present collective oversight and responsibility. And um, there are plenty examples, the data as labor approach. Um, this is actually an approach that says that the data is the labor, not that data producers are laborers, but data is the labor. So this is quite a, a radical approach. Um, Arieta Ibarra et al. Um, data trust, some data trust approaches, not all of them, some of them are just individual uh, data vaults uh, that help individual level monetization and they call, it, call themselves a trust, but some data trust approaches are collective approaches. And then our solidarity-based data governance approach. Um, and I want to just um, give you an example of what we're doing in terms of trying to think about what instruments and institutions of collective responsibility and oversight we need because it's not enough to say we need more collective oversight let us think of what we could do so um, and i'm not going to to uh, spend a long time with uh, explaining how we understand solidarity um, because we've published this and anyone who has an interest in solidarity um, has uh, can, can can see our and if you're interested in our take on it, you can, you can, you can um, look that up. But um, what is important to highlight here is that we uh, do understand solidarity as a practice, a practice that is based on people um, seeing parts of themselves and other people. So something with other people that we share in common. These are not, not in nativist essentialist criteria so that I'm saying, I'm a woman, you're a woman, so we have to be solidaristic. But I'm recognizing in others what I have learned to recognize. And it's really, our approach to solidarity is really underpinned by a relational ontology. So I'm referring here to thinkers such as, such as Natalie Stolger, Katriona McKenzie, and um, uh, Jennifer Nedelsky, to, to use a, a dimension, a legal scholar, who have really gone against this individualistic and some, some of those thinkers also rightly I think call it masculinist idea that the world consists of in the ideally independent autonomous entities when the world is really inhabited by people who are related to their natural social and artifactual environments and become autonomous through those connections and not despite of them so this is our underpinning of, of solidarity and based on this um, we also distinguish between three levels of solidarity when we speak about actual practice. Solidarity between people, uh, between individuals, if you will, 
that's tier one, then we have group level solidarity. And when solidaristic practice solidifies into bureaucratic contractual legal norms, we speak of tier three solidarity. And there are some, re some reasons I think where it's uh, very helpful to actually keep those three levels apart because, sorry, in some societies, the third level is still intact and levels two and one are falling apart or the other way around. Levels one and two exist and they haven't materialized, they haven't solidified into three. So, but what can we do on the basis of this with, um, with data governance? So we have three main pillars in our work. And the first one is to actually facilitate data use that has public value. So I'm often confronted when I work with, uh, with and in medical context with people telling me, well, we can't even keep the artificial intelligence developers in healthcare because they can't do anything with healthcare data. You need 500 um, steps with consenting patients, reconsenting patients, um, um, research ethics committee uh, um, approvals before you can use data that patients want us to use. This is what practitioners always say. Patients want us to use it. We're not allowed to. So when we will, when, when there are instances where data use clearly has public value, we need to um, facilitate the use and we need to make it easier. We have some ideas about how, and I won't get into this here, um, but I'm happy to uh, address it obviously afterwards. Uh, the, the, the second part I will say a little bit more about, which is harm mitigation. I think we need much, much better harm mitigation below the level of legal redress because some people do not have access to, to legal remedies. Um, we need something that is fairly a low threshold, informal, and I will say a little bit more about that. And then the third, which we are working on, is some kind of benefit sharing when data use, corporate data use, has no obvious public value. You know, when, for example, a large search engine uses data to improve the services that help them get ad revenue. This is not necessarily a, an evil thing to do, but it has no obvious public value. Some part of that profit needs to come back into the public domain. Of course, everything hinges on how do we determine what, is public, what has public value. And we have some beginning of, a, of, a, of an answer to that. I'm fully aware that this is not um, the, end, the end of it, and this is not a fully satisfying answer. Um, but we are thinking about benefits for people, for future generations, for, for individuals and groups, um, without um, causing significant and undue harm for people. And of course, public benefit and public value is more pronounced when it benefits those who are disadvantaged. Harm mitigation. I'll say a little bit more about that as an because it's an instrument of collective oversight and governance that we have fleshed out in much more detail. And we've published it also um, earlier this year in the Medical Law Review, um, where we say that at a time when data harm or harm from data use can arise from practices that do not breach any laws, um, practices that might be unlawful, but it's very hard to prove it. It's very hard for people to prove that there's any kind of connection between a specific action and the harm. We need something that is an institutionalized form of saying, okay, uh, citizens, we are expecting you to accept some risks. We are using data for some purposes that are seen as having public benefit, but we will not leave you alone if something happens to you. So these harm mitigation bodies that we propose to create um, and in the paper, we also say how they should be funded. They have three main functions. They should collect information systematically on the types of data harms that occur. At the moment, we do not have that. Um, they are, can also relay information back to uh, data users and legislators, policymakers on what can be done to decrease the uh, occurrence of, or, or to, to even forbid the types of practices that cause this harm. But to, to make sure that this harm doesn't occur that often. And in hard cases, they can provide financial support. This is not restitution. This is not compensation. This is really a financial support where other sources fail. And again, of course, there are lots of questions probably about that, but um, I 
uh, I have, we have spelled them out in the paper and we're continuing to develop that. Um, so the, uh, the last pillar, um, we call it the data tax. There are lots of discussions going on about data taxes. Um, and a proposal that I like very much is that um, uh, Alina Blankert and others are now arguing that actually data generating and data collecting devices should be um, uh, levied in a sense that they that, that the companies that produce them um, pay something uh, into the public domain um, in return for the data that they use for their own uh, private profits and so on. But I know that this is incredibly difficult um, and that the data tax is probably a a technically a tax is might probably do more harm than good. Um, but this is a, a space of, of, of ongoing discussions. And I just wanted to highlight that this is something that we are thinking about um, in collaboration with others as well. So the last five minutes that I have, I want to go into, I, I want to speak about nudging. And nudging might at, if at first sight not have anything to do with data use, right? Nudging is, as you know, um, this is the classical Thaler and uh, Sunstein definition. Um, any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without significantly changing the economic incentives. The classical cafeteria case put the apples where people wait and queue and not the chocolate bars. And this sounds great, right? And actually, in many ways, um, nudging is fantastically attractive. Um, it addresses the demand side of policy making rather than the supply, the supply side. Um, it seems to not impose any, anybody's value preferences of people, uh, onto people. And it's a value neutral vehicle to help people to do what they really want to do. This is what the proponents of nudging say. And of course, it's cheap and effective, it can be done easily. That's also what the proponents say. I think nudging is a massive data governance problem because if we, if we are now using people's data from Amazon um, purchases, from, from healthcare um, use and so on, to, to analyze it at the aggregate level and then to break it down back um, into individual suggestions and individual instruments to tackle behavior at the individual level, we're doing a couple of things that are politically quite significant and I argue problematic. So, and I have a whole list of uh, scholars who have made not that argument, but who have teased out why nudging is very politically uh, and ideology laden. Of course, nudging is a quick fix for the rational actor axiom and thus incompatible with the relational ontology. So although um, some of the proponents of nudging like to claim that uh, behavioral economics in particular proves the rational actor axiom wrong. It is not that. They want to fix it. They want to help people to be rational. They want to help you overcome your cognitive bias to be rational. Second, the very choice of nudging is a value judgment. So what are we saying? We're saying that uh, policymakers and the collective should be, should be relieved of their responsibility to create structures that help people to make good decisions. So instead of instead of building parks, sidewalks, instead of making sure that people have healthy neighborhoods, we are nudging them to, to um, reduce their calorie intake. That's quite a political statement to do. So this is where the data governance problem is. Of course, this is not an argument against datafication. I'm not saying I don't capture data about people's mobility, about what people buy in grocery stores. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying Let's not use it to, to, to tackle individuals and tell them to behave differently. But let's, as, as Eleanor Ostrom said, let's build institutions that bring out the best in people. And in that sense, it's a massive data governance question where we, if we have collective oversight over how data are used, can say, we want our data to be used to for example, find out where people might need more help with X or Y, where people might need um, um, 
now in the, during the corona crisis, more um, access to certain services and so on and so on. So of course we can use data, but we should use it not to um, target individuals. So I think this is something that in some narrow circumstances makes sense, but overall um, is problematic. And I think this is also an outcome of a solidarity based, based data governance, that in addition to focusing on individual control, we, we ask this kind of larger political questions. And with this, I'm actually done. So I do argue that solidarity based data governance um, has the advantage that it offers a relational rather than individualistic understanding of both data subject and data. It overcomes the dichotomy between individual and collective interests and benefits. Not to say that these are the same or they should always align, but it, they're not a dichotomy very often. Privacy is a personal and, and a collective right and interest. And it gives guidance for the creation of institutions that either harness practices of mutual support where they exist. You know, the classical patients that want to share their data, but they're not allowed to. And also facilitate, uh, hopefully, practices that um, share the risks and the benefits. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Barbara. So now we're going to turn to Martin for a response. Martin. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Barbara, for a fascinating paper and a fascinating talk. Um, when I was asked to be the commentator, I had kind of the benefit of first having the topic, then having a paper, the medical law journal paper by, by Barbara and her colleague, and then seeing the slides and finally now hearing the presentation. So I had time to think, what would I say? if the theme was solidarity the governance and that results in that i'm not even going to try to address all aspects of barbara's fascinating presentation it's a rich and partly sketchy project where some pieces appear to fit together and about some pieces i'm not so sure but i i won't try to make sense of it. I'll, I'll, I'll try, just try to address some dimensions where I think I have something to say from the, my own background in human rights law. And for that reason, they are a bit procedural, but the, the, the fact that they are a bit procedural is that in your journal article, the emphasis is so strongly on the harm mitigation body. So that, that drove my thinking, I don't believe in this. What could be a better model for solidarity-based data governance if one were to look into uh, mechanisms of remedy, redress, uh, what kind of institutional procedural structures would help in, in um, promoting and implementing a solidarity-based data governance model. And my first uh, critical comment is, I'm not so sure where the solidarity is in your model. Where is the solidarity? And, and I, I, could, I could understand the data with, with public benefit. But th there is a strong solidarity dimension. But then when you speak about the, let's say, procedural institutional consequences, it, it was all but clear that how, for instance, your uh, harm mitigation bodies would be solidarity-based. I understood they are not law-based, but still they appeared to me as quite individualistic. And the, the danger you see of uh, litigation-based models being very individualistic could be repeated in those structures, just with a different uh, type of normativity underlying the use of those procedures. So what I'm thinking is, first, a note about uh, the right to privacy, which is seen as a very individualistic right. But I think uh, the proposal I'm going to make is that, that the right to privacy is also a very good prism or proxy for addressing all kinds of human rights harms that result from the uh, collection and processing of data. And this is one of the main finding, findings from the 
FP7 project surveil, where I was the project leader, that we started by looking at negative human rights impact across the board, across all human rights. And we came to the conclusion, semi-empirically, semi-empirically, that, that privacy can be used as a proxy for the general harms because so many issues related to other human rights can be addressed through the impact that is immediately generated through privacy abuses. Here, of course, uh, one have to, has to include both the mother right, traditional privacy, and then the daughter right, uh, the right to the protection of personal data. So I'm speaking of those two current fundamental rights as being par 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 parts of the package of, of privacy in general. Uh, and, and, and now I come to the procedures in the sense that I think the most suitable example of a solidarity-based model that exists in written treaty law is the one under the European Social Charter, the collective complaints procedure, which is primarily for trade unions, but not exclusively. Uh, the, the, the treaty itself allows for other non-governmental organizations to be the complainants and to act in public interest. Countries have been reluctant to accept the extension to all, all categories of civil society actors, but some have accepted. And, and there, most importantly, the standard for finding a treaty breach is not a violation of the rights of a victim but rather unsatisfactory application of the provisions of the treaty, which means that failure to act under positive obligations is a treaty breach without having to prove anybody as a victim, without having to have individual victims and without having to exhaust domestic remedies. The system is not very well known, the system is not very well functioning, but I see a potential that the wide scope of economic, social, cultural rights could be addressed through the collective complaints procedure of the European Social Charter by bringing in uh, privacy as a proxy. Why is the right to health violated? Why is, why is there a right, violation of right to education, etc.? Because non-compliance with privacy rights in data management or, or, or otherwise. So one could, one could go that track. The UN uh, Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights is much more modest. I mean, the optional protocol of complaints because it has adopted, I think wrongly, the traditional approach of an individual victim. So it's for individual complaints who prove to be victims of a violation, uh, which, which makes it for these purposes, a weaker one. And then, of course, uh, the idea of that kind of a failure uh, to, to act in accordance with positive obligations extends to non-discrimination and extends to uh, civil and political rights. And in particular, under non-discrimination, it's already accepted how failure to act is a form of discrimination, be it direct or indirect discrimination, but the discriminatory effect on its own will be a breach, a violation, even, even a justi justiciable individual violation. And then I come to the, to the conclusion, tentative conclusion, that I don't think we need to separate the applicable normative standard from law as so, so strictly as you appear to suggest. I think we should think of human rights law providing the normative standard against which the mass harm uh, could be addressed. Negative impact upon human rights could be a good basis. And, and I take the European Social Charter model and, and perhaps even the treaty and the collective complaints procedure as a vanguard, how it could be utilized and operationalized at the international level. What that then means in domestic law might be, uh, uh, might be, the notion of tort in many common law countries or uh, civil damages in civil law countries part of the civil code or part of the of the of a, of a separate damages act and and importantly this would be one 
area where we clearly would need on the domestic level class action provision for a class action where membership of a group would allow joining existing litigation. This is all law. On the international level, we have the European Social Charter or analogous collective complaint mechanisms and domestic law. We have class action based on tort or based on civil damages uh, legislation. And then there's the third question where your model looks into procedures also in the in the in the private sphere meaning data controllers would have their harms mitigation bodies and i think that too is an approach worth pursuing but i wouldn't make the separation normatively from legal standards i would say yes a company can try to shield itself or a field of business can try to shield themselves by creating a joint collective complaints body. But the standards should be of legal nature. Uh, if it is a different normativity, then I think there should be some kind of a voluntary, voluntarily accepted ethics code, which would be their applicable standard, agreed in advance. I fear that, 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 that the normative standard to be applied cannot be free floating as 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 i read your uh, journal article that there wouldn't be a pre-existing standard there would be simply the notion of harm or even in some parts of your text you say experience of harm which i i don't think is a solid basis for getting anybody on board so an ethics code for a company ethics code for a field of business or international human rights law would, in my view, be better placed to form the normative standard against which to address the harms. Human rights harms would be the harms that would be, would be addressed. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. And I'm going to give Barbara a few minutes to respond to, to your comments because I think she might like to do that before we turn open to the floor. And just a reminder people to send any questions they have through the Q&A. Barbara? Thank you very much, Martin. This is uh, very helpful. And then I um, try to note down as, as, my, as work is in front of my window, excuse. Excuse the, uh, the the noise, please. Um, I, I try to capture as much as possible of what you said because it will be very helpful also in our work going forward. Thank you. So there are a couple of points where I, if I understand you correctly, I, I agree. And I will take on your suggestion um, without uh, any, <laughs> any sort of um, disagreement. So the, your comment, as I'll start, um, start at the end, your comment that standards should be of a legal nature and they should not be free, free floating normative standards unless it's a voluntary um, ethics code. I think that's, a, that, that, that's very helpful. I can tell you why we did not arrive at this conclusion. And pa partly I don't, I still don't, after what you said, I still don't know how we're going to solve this. I think we do not know yet what the, range and nature of harms is that people are experiencing. So for example, when um, this is a, 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 a real case, of course, when um, you type in your name and prostitute pops up with your name, right? Or when, um, when, when people are, um, when people feel that they are being monitored too much, despite there being no clear relationship to any privacy right in the, in the, in the strict sense of the word being broken or any, any wrongdoing, any, any norm being broken on the side of the data uh, processes. So how do we know, how do, how do we arrive at, um, at standards of a legal nature without first figuring out what the nature of harm is? Sorry, I dropped my notes. Um, but um, I think you have convinced me that creating an entirely separate structure um, might, might not be a good idea, but it needs to 
derive from the same um, 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 set of norms. Um, so where's the solidarity uh, in this model? Um, and this relates to also your, your, your statement that um, we already have solidarity-based instruments um, as such, for example, in the collective complaints procedure. I'll, I'll try to answer or to address both in, in one answer. Um, there's a clear and obvious, and I would say easy solidarity discernible in instruments such as the collective complaints procedure. I, I absolutely agree that if this were a functioning instrument, this would be a fantastic example of solidarity based data governance. But this is, these are instances where people get together to do something collectively. And that's one dimension of solidarity-based data governance. This is, so the citizen trust, uh, sorry, the data trust, for example, would be another one. But what I'm trying to do, and I think this is what the relational ontology really means, is that you bring, you, you don't only bring the person into the collective and the person together with others to form a collective and to act as a collective, but you bring the collective into the person. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. So, and, and this is the answer, I think, to, to your question about Western solidarity. In the, in the harm mitigation instrument, for example, you are right that, har that harm mitigation could also be argued um, on the basis of other principles and practices, but it is a response to the problem that on the one hand, I think we need to, we need to embrace people accepting some informational risks to, to, to support others by allowing the data being used for certain purposes. But then the, on, the, on the other side, we also need to say, if something happens, if something goes wrong, you will have support and you will have support that, that is um, accessible enough for you to have a, a reasonable um, chance of making use of it, even if you cannot if you cannot prove that your uh, privacy rights have been infringed, even if you cannot um, uh, make plausible the connection between an action and, 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 and harm, and so on and so on. So in that sense, I'm trying to bring the, the concern for collective well-being into the practices of persons. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying individuals, but of persons, because persons are individual and collective at the same time. That's, that's the solidarity in the harm mitigation mechanism. So I'll, I'll, uh, um, I think I'll stop here. You, you said much more and I thank you for it, but maybe some other points get picked up or you want to come back about them. But thank you very much. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick up some of the questions that have arisen now. I have some questions I'd like to put myself, but let, I'm going to pick up the ones that have arisen. So the first one, Barbara, is to what extent, um, I mean, do you have any, can you, can you give us some more idea about how you might facilitate the use of data in the public interest? In other words, both, I suppose, the mechanisms for control to make sure it is in the public interest, what would we consider to be in the public interest, et cetera. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? I'm gonna give you a couple of things. And then Martin, of course, if you want to respond, um, that would be great. Another question was, so when we talk about solidarity, I mean, you talk about it as having, seeing to some extent the yourself in other people. And then you quickly said, but of course, I don't mean identity characteristics. Um, the questioner, which seems to me already, you know, it's quite difficult, this idea of what, is, do we mean solidarity with everybody else? You seem to suggest that it was actually a solidarity with somebody with whom you had something in common. Um, but the, the questioner's concern is that actually this may become a kind of majoritarian understanding of what is solidarity or the, the view of the majority in society. And that may potentially be um, used in ways that might have negative effects on minority groups. So just exploring a little bit more your conception of solidarity. Uh, is it with every other human being or only some of them? And how do we, once it isn't every other human being, how do we avoid the risk of sort of identitarian approaches or as the questioner puts, majoritarian approaches? Um, maybe we'll stop there. there. There's There are other interesting questions. If I stop there so you can get an opportunity to respond and um, Martin, of course, if you'd like to come and do so. Martin, would you like to go first? 
I, I prefer you to go first, Barbara, because sure. I have only a small thing to say now. Um, yeah, so thank you, Kate, and thank you to everyone who asked these questions. And examples for making it, to for, for examples of facilitating um, data use in the public interest. My caveat is I do not have a good way of, of operationalizing the establishment of what public interest is in every instance. This is a big caveat, I know that. But assuming that we know what is in the public interest, and I'm using an example here, um, non-profit, a very paradigmatic example, non-profit um, um, health research um, for rare disease patients. Uh, here, for example, um, some patient data, patient information cannot be used because patient cannot be consented or reconsented. Um, so here, for example, we could have, we could operate, we could work much, much more with broad consent um, solutions and um, broad consent solutions that have, of course, that, that, that are embedded in a governance model where there is um, patient representation oversight. So I'm not suggesting that the doctor, the, the clinical researcher alone makes a decision on what is, what is a good use of data. But so we have, we work, we operate more with what Barbara Koenig called um, the consent to be governed. So we have systems where people opt into a, a, a field of practice with an initial broad consent and at the granular level what their information is used for, these decisions are made by a governance body and this should happen fast and it should happen relatively unbureaucratic. That, that's one way of, 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 of um, thinking about it. Um, other examples of how to use, of how to facilitate the use of data for, that have um, public value or the, where the research has public value, we actually know from um, public health research and public health exemptions. So in some cases, we could use public health exemptions as an analogy to other forms of data use that, are, that have public value. So this was um, my, my, my first response to the public uh, value question. The identity, the, the, the solidarity question, I have given a lot of thought to already. So, and I'm, I'm grateful that this question allows me to say a little bit more about that because I'm, I'm conscious that I uh, went, went through that part very quickly. So, the, in, in our conceptualization, solidarity is a situation where despite all the differences between people, um, what gives rise to action are the commonalities. So what are commonalities? Commonalities are not necessarily, or you know, commonalities that, are, that, that correspond with um, demographic characteristics, um, that, dem that correspond with uh, um, having a particular faith, gender, a nationality whatsoever. It can be, but this is where the practice context comes in and we, we are very influenced by practice epistemologies here. Um, the practice context determines what a similarity in a relevant respect is. So um, we are never solidaristic with other women in general, but when somebody makes a, a sexist joke, we might be solidaristic with the woman um, in the room, even if we are not a woman ourselves. So the, the practical context determines the reference point for what counts as a similarity. And, and I recognize as a similarity with others what I've been socialized to recognize. So for example, the example that I give in this context is very often the introduction of body mass index that enabled people to recognize someone as, someone as other if, the, if they were fat you know, according to the body mass index measurements. So we, alert, we, we learn um, processes and categories of othering and, and a political discourse, public discourse is very, very important in making us see or make, making it more likely that we see differences or commonalities in others. In the corona crisis here, the Austrian uh, chancellor emphasize, has emphasized for a while over and over that we need to help uh, people in and of our country, which makes it much more difficult to see a similarity with the, the children and the people in Moria in the refugee camps. So 
So what I'm trying to emphasize is that things that we recognize as a similarity depend on the context of practice. If, there were, if we were in the same room and there would be a fire alarm, we would help each other out. The similarity might be that we are running away from the same danger. It's a relatively time constrained, small similarity that once we are out of danger, it is no longer binding us together. But it might be something much more, um, some, something much bigger. It might be when, when we think of institutionalized solidarity in a healthcare system, a shared human vulnerability, the fact that we will all get ill in some points of our lives or have been ill, that is a very large existential characteristics that we can recognize in others or not. And the setting up of the NHS was a classical example. We knew that some people would incur much higher costs, people coming back with injuries, um, mental health problems from the war, um, people having chronic diseases. We know that some people incur more costs, but we said we ignore it um, and everyone pays, everyone gets what they need. So it can be something small, it can be something big. And now I'm getting to the end. I'm sorry for taking so long. Of course, solidarity can also take a, a form that we consider problematic. Of course, there's solidarity within racist, sexist communities. I think if we understand solidarity as, an, as a mechanism of being and acting, then in order to justify whether, or in order to argue that a particular kind of solidarity is good or bad, it needs, it needs other substantive values to be connected with. So in healthcare, it's very often connect, in connection with social justice and, and, and access. Um, in other fields, uh, it's other substantive values that are uh, conjoined with solidarity in order to make a normative argument. I think we are really over, we were making solidarity to do much too much work if we consider it a good thing in every respect. The effect is if we do that, is that it becomes a very formulaic vehicle where we can you know, squeeze everything in that at a particular moment of time we consider good. Um, so I think we need to talk about solidarity as a, as, a, as, a praxis, as a practice, as a mechanism of making commonalities the cause for action and the, the base of institutions, but they are not normatively good and desirable in every context and in every respect. So I do see the danger that can be misused, absolutely. Well, it's an interesting response. And I do wonder whether you don't then need to put one of the, some normative constraints into your assessment, which ensure that it is, as it were, a benevolent form of solidarity that is used in relation to big data, um, because yeah. that seems to underpin, um, you know, underpin your approach and um, that, that you recognize actually that there are, that, 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 that you are looking at a solidarity that would in fact be benevolent. And the question is, well, what are those values that determine that benevolence? I'm gonna to turn to another um, question now, which is the, you commented about the, the red tape and you've mentioned it again in some of your answers that um, public bodies and public interest research organizations face um, in relation to uh, getting access to big data in order to conduct research. And the, the question who's, who's one of our colleagues at the um, Bonavero, Oliver Butler asks is, to what extent does that red tape reflect an individualistic approach to regulation? And to what extent uh, could it be redesigned to protect collective interests based on solidarity? Um, he has in mind privacy by design as a potential means of promoting solidarity and could see that historic failures to seek the relevant consents may be an example of individualistic red tape. So, just really thinking about if we were thinking about um, those forms of red tape that present, prevent, for example, access to big data um, for, res for research purposes that we think are in the public interest as you know, the kind of uh, answer to the first question, um, you know, how would we identify forms of red tape that we, we think are actually too individualistic in character and, and are undermining, uh, a ben for the want of a better word, a benevolent solidarity? Um, so I'm not going to pretend that this is always easy to do, but I do think we can do much better in listening to people um, and listening and learning from empirical research. So um, there's a lot of good research out there on what people 
in the capacities as patients or citizens want. Um, and we, I do not see this translated in, in, into instruments um, and even consenting procedures at all. So for example, we, we know that people care deeply about whether their um, data and, and, and tissue and information will help other people, even if they can't benefit themselves. They care deeply about that or whether it will mostly um, um, foster uh, commercial interests. Um, so do we have this information in consent forms? No. Um, we also know, this is actually research that, that, that I've also been involved with myself together with uh, Susan Kelly in Exeter. We know that people's um, preferences in terms of how they want to give consent and whether they want to be asked for their consent depends on who does the research. We don't differentiate between who does the research. So I think by listening to people, by looking at the, the results of good empirical evidence on what people care about, that can help us to distinguish where um, we're sticking with the um, requirements that aim to protect individual rights just because of a lock-in effect or because we try, try to protect us from litigation or whether it's really to protect the, the autonomy of people as individual and collective. So that, that, that's one thing. And, and a situation where um, a lot of uh, patients or a lot of court uh, research participants say, I'd rather you use my research if you, if you use it to, to make other people healthier or, or to create cures. And then somebody has to say, I'm not allowed to do it unless you sign this form again. I think this is something we can really do away with relatively quickly. And, and I, would, I would always immediately add that at the same time, we need to make sure that we have um, civil society, patient representation in these govern, governance models, but that it's not somebody in their room, in their office deciding. So, so I think, yes, I, I think we have the, the red tape around data use is a, a remnant of a misunderstood or maybe anachronistic understanding of protection of individual rights. Um, and we, we can, privacy by design is when it's created through deliberative models and through, and through deliberation, when it's decided how to enact and engineer privacy by design, it can absolutely be uh, uh, an instrument also of, of uh, protecting collective interests and, and, and facilitating um, data use that is in the public interest. It can be, but not necessarily. It can also be a tokenistic exercise to, to get uh, you know, the regulator off your back. Uh, thanks very much, Barbara. Martin, anything you want to say on any of these questions? I think you're- Well, I, I, I drop, I, I'll drop what I had in mind originally, and uh, I'll just address something which came into my mind now listening to Barbara's answers is that that the notion of solidarity may need a little bit of conceptual framing and it's actually in the preposition do we mean solidarity among or solidarity with that solidarity among is very much about collective action mass harm um, uh, class action collective complaints everybody within the groups knows that united we are stronger by protecting everybody's interest the collective interest i'm protecting my own interest but since solidarity with is is an altruistic form of solidarity and that, that i think uh requires separate treatment it's it's a question of empathy in relation to somebody who is in a different position than myself Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, I was thinking when Barbara was speaking about the concept of solidarity during the anti-apartheid movement, where mm -hmm. there was a lot of people talking in the language of solidarity yeah. uh, with people struggling against apartheid. But apart from a sense of a kind of common humanity, which uh, was appalled at apartheid, it, it was more the solidarity with than the sol solidarity among, at least in many cases. Uh, Bob, any quick thoughts on that? Yes, I totally disagree here, Martin. I so, and actually, I disagree with the words of Marilyn Strathern, who once said at the at the se at the seminar um, um, where we discussed solidarity, and I used the term altruism, and she said these are incommensurable words. 
So solida altruism is a disposition towards the world. I can be the last person on earth and be altruistic. Um, it's not a relational notion. I think it sits squarely with a relational approach where solidarity always requires a receiver. And it's not only that you do solidarity, but it does you. It changes both. And this is why I think as a heuristic, um, solidarity with and among is a help. It's very helpful heuristic. Um, but I think it also shades into one another because if I'm, solidar I'm solidaristic with, um, let's say, um, uh, victims of an earthquake on the other side of the world or people who are the victims of, of, of racist abuse, although I'm not the victim of racist abuse, it's also among. And it doesn't mean that I'm then also part of the same ethnic minority or religious minority, but it, it draws me into a community of people who stand together to fight against a certain type of oppression for a certain cause. So I'm not saying it's exactly the same thing. And if I oppose oppression of men and I'm a woman or the other way around, a homosexual and I'm a heterosexual person, then I become exactly like them. But it, it does something with me too. It, it, it increases the, it creates a new we um, that is not fully captured in with and among, I think. Good, thank you. So um, the next question that I've got is, um, uh, in you, you talk about the kind of harm mitigation measures and your harm mitigation bodies. Um, is, is it your view that that should be a government initiative or is it something that could be taken at a in, um, in kind of civil society or by private organizations? I mean, could you imagine a large corporate, say, Google, setting up a harm mitigation body? No, I would not want to do that. I, I would not want that. Um, I think that the, the framework needs to be um, uh, a framework provided by um, national or EU, but let's stick with national here, um, national law, um, and that then... Um, there could be um, associations uh, that that companies pay into that would, however, have to be governed by an independent entity. So they would have to be governed by um, independent uh, data subject representatives. And the, 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 the framework for this within which um, these harm mitigation bodies would need to operate would need to be provided by law. Um, so I don't think that it would be a good idea to say that uh, every uh, data, data processing corporation above a certain size needs to have an, a harm mitigation body and they should set it up themselves and self-regulate and have a couple of um, uh, citizens uh, on their board. So I think it would need to be, it would need to have a much, much stronger uh, civil society uh, governance independent government. Of course, it doesn't necessarily need to be either or, does it? I mean, if one looks, for example, at ombuds processes in financial institutions, whether it's banks or insurance companies, they do provide a mechanism for people to get relief um, without necessarily the difficulties of using the legal process. So, I mean, is, is there a problem with um, multi-layered forms of um, harm mitigation, or do, do you really think it has to be state or uh, super state oriented? No, I think I think a multi-layered nested um, approach is definitely definitely possible and perhaps even desirable. Um, also because it's more once established, more difficult to do away with. So um, anything that is um, uh, that has one centralized um, source, also in terms of funding, would be much easier to undo. So a multi-layer nested uh, system would be desirable from my point of view. Okay. Um, Martin, you'll come in if you want to say anything, won't you? Yeah. So then the, uh, there's another question. Uh, there's um, um, in follow up to that last question, somebody commented that, um, well, I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, so turning to the public interest um, um, that in, you, in the framework that you work towards, um, you really are admitting that actually we don't fully know what that public interest is. This is a kind of matter we have to work on to try and just to, to define it. Um, 
I mean, can we, um, can we allow that to be something that might be explored in your framework? In other words, could the framework be designed in a way that might itself not only uh, might en enable us to understand what public interest is, or is in fact that got to be something separate that we have to do prior to getting involved in data regulation? In other words, do we, is it an anterior question or is it something that can be dealt with within the system, the, the model that you propose? That's a very good question. Um, I find it very helpful. I don't think I have a good answer to this. Um, I think that we have to have a working definition of, not a working definition, we have to have a, a predetermined set of criteria against which we would in specific cases determine um, whether something has public value or not. So I think that set of criteria needs to exist outside of the framework. I don't think that, you know, the criteria should be absolutely um, free floating as, as, as it is. Um, but I do believe that we also need a flexibility that enables those who assess whether something is, um, whether something has public value to account for the specific sort of context of practice and the functional context in which it takes place. Um, in housing, it would be very, very different than in, in, in healthcare. And also there are instances where we probably could think of um, loyalty card information Do we put it could use uh, for public value. I will now uh, do something that is not strategically smart, but to give you, to, 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 to share with you what I think is the biggest problem with this um, public value determination. The biggest problem is, in my view, that if, as we outline in the paper, it will be the owners of the data processing organization to argue that specific data uses have public value, it will be the companies that already have the legal muscle to argue that they shouldn't pay tax, they shouldn't pay tax, and they shouldn't be uh, they should be allowed to do this and that. That then will also use this legal muscle to argue that almost anything they do has public value. Whereas for smaller organizations and institutions, it will be much much more difficult. I do think that for some types of institutions, there should be a legal exemption where it should a legal presumption that what they do has public value. Um, that, that should be regularly assessed whether that still is the case, but there should be an exemption. But I do think this sort of power differential problem is, is, a, is a problem with the public value determination that, that I don't have a solution for. But Martin has a solution. <laughs> Rather, I'm joining you in your self-critical reflection in the sense that if we, if we speak of public interest or public value, it very easily will be the government of the nation state which will interpret what they invoke is the public interest and that will persuade whatever the, the body is that is dealing with the issue. And that's how it works in human rights litigation, that the, the, the state claims that there is a public interest justification for a measure. and and the state is then best placed and the adjudicatory body will address whether whether their reasons are weighty enough so um, my solution if you want the solution <laughs> is that it should be enjoyment of human rights rather than public interest or public value uh, which would then also entail that you cannot use for instance economic growth or profit of the company as a proxy. There are all kinds of economic theories which say making the super rich more rich will benefit everybody because the wealth will trickle down and they are the one who make the innovations. So we should favor their tax benefits also in the future. Uh, but that has a multiple, multiple layered system of proxies built in and, and we can all say, or many of us can say, that those economic theories haven't been empirically proven, but they make the claim. So that's why I think the enjoyment of human rights is a better standard than public interest or public value. It's very helpful. Thank you, Martin.
Yeah. Well, thank, to, thank you to you both. It's been a really interesting conversation. And thanks to all of those who have um, been with us today. Just a reminder that we have a couple of other events coming up uh, at the Bonavera over the next week. This evening, we've got a book launch, uh, Pablos Eleve Eleftiriades' book on a Union of Peoples on the European Union, which is a legal and political theory argu argument about the nature of um, the European Union, and um, that will be a very interesting discussion. It is this evening at 5.15 UK time. Um, and then next Tuesday in this discussion group seri series, we've got um, a barrister from Northern Ireland, Alison Kilpatrick, talking about reviewing police human rights compliance in Northern Ireland. It's something of a topical issue in the United Kingdom at the moment. So um, the respondent there will be um, the former research fellow of the Bonavera Institute, Dr. Richard Martin, who's now at the LSE. Um, so please do join us next Tuesday for that. And then there are a series of other events planned during the term. So please do either register for our newsletter or look on our website. And then finally, just to say a very big thank you to both Barbara and Martin for this really interesting conversation. Um, I think they have made us think a lot about what it might mean to think about um, solidarity in, um, in the context of big data what, um, and what ways in which we might build to ensure that we can build human rights compliant benefits from big data without unduly, um, without unduly building barriers around it. Um, that is a challenge and in many ways it is one of the key focuses not only of Barbara's work um, going forward but also of Martin's research project while he's at the Bonavera. So I imagine we'll come back to these conversations uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, for the rest, thanks very much to all of you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, we, we're delighted that you were able to be here. Bye now. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much.